right. Uh, welcome once again to another installment of our online Bible study that we've been putting out every week on Wednesdays for a little while now. And uh, there are several things that uh, as we went up through the summer, we got to look at different lives of, of people, and uh, which I thought was a lot of fun. Uh, and so we spent several weeks in Jonah and several weeks in Ruth and several weeks doing this and that. And so uh, Daniel and his uh, compatriots in Babylon, we, we did that. Uh, we also spent the last several weeks in uh, talking about the life of Samson, which I particularly enjoyed. Uh, for, for a lot of reasons, I think sometimes we stick to the familiar and, and we stay here and there. And, and those kind of stories are, are like Sunday school stories that we, we hear a little bit of and we, did, we don't always dive into um, a more detailed look at them. And so we've done that uh, in, and had a good summer, I hope, doing some of those things. We've been doing that on Sunday morning some too. Uh, so I thought that was fun. Uh, in looking at what to do next, I want to kind of stay in the same vein, but instead of looking at a, um, a person, uh, which is always fun. The characters in the Bible are certainly <laughs> colorful characters. Uh, but to look at another concept, uh, to go way back to kind of the, the, towards the beginning of the Old Testament and look at an idea that I think God thought was very important. And uh, an idea that I think sometimes we think of today's a little outdated if we just look at it on the surface of it. And, and I want to dive in and look at it a little bit more closely, but that idea uh, stems from the, the Ten Commandments. And so if you remember the Ten Commandments, if, if you were God and you put yourself in the situation, Genesis is kind of over and you're, you've gotten the people out of Egypt and you're wanting to make a nation out of this group and and you set up a series of laws. And we remember the story about Moses ascending Mount Sinai. He's going to come down with the Ten Commandments. And most of us would remember what most of the Ten Commandments are. If we sat down and looked at those, we could think about those. Don't kill, don't steal, things like that. What about the first one? If you were God, would you make that kind of the most important? And if you do look at God and, and think that God probably made the first commandment the most important, I think he did, then he combines it really quickly with, with something that I think most of us today would, would see as outdated, maybe didn't apply to us. So I want to dive into that and look at that story. When, when God uh, set up the Ten Commandments, the first one was love the Lord your God. And, and so that's not a surprising thing. If we go to the New Testament, Jesus was asked, what's the most important thing? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. When we look at all the stories uh, of the Old Testament, the ones we covered all summer long, at some point or another, the main character or one of the main characters has to admit, God is God. The Lord is God. God is my God. And, and so that recognition is, is primary that God is God, that the Lord, he is God. The next step would be, <laughs> maybe we're not God. Uh, if we admit that God is God, that we're not God. And then it, the things that we create can't be God and so forth. So I want to read a little bit. We're going to read in uh, Exodus chapter 20, just just for the first uh, commandment, because th there's a couple in there, one with Sabbath and, and this one that, that God explains a little bit more. Some of them just get several, don't do this. <laughs> or as we recall from, from Old English, uh, thou shalt not. <laughs> um, and the rest of them get, some of them get a little bit more explanation. So this one gets a little more explanation. So let's read in Exodus chapter 20, uh, starting in verse 1. It says, and God spoke all these words saying, and so th these are words directly from God. We sometimes overlook that fact, but this is not a prophet saying this, is not Moses' best example. This is something we receive from God. And he said, the first thing is, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, he reminds them what he did for them. And the first commandments have no other gods before me. No, I'm God, no, no other God. But then immediately he dives into, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So he says, you know, I'm God, you're not. <laughs> you have no other gods before me. I'm to be the only, the only is a sticking point. Uh, the early uh, Israelites didn't mind worshiping God, but then they, they couldn't see God. And because they couldn't see God, there was an element of unknown, and they, they, they were more comfortable, as I think we are at some point, with the known. And this is the way it goes down, because on the next trip up the mountain, okay, one trip already we have, and then there's another uh, explanation in Exodus chapter 32, I believe. 
when Moses comes down, they say, oh, well, you were gone so long. We didn't know if you were coming back. So we made an image. <laughs> Exodus 20, don't make an image. God says, Exodus 32, story of the golden calf, the <laughs> image that they made with all the gold they brought out of Egypt, all the gold that God set up for them to bring out of Egypt. They used that gold. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. He says, don't make a carved image. <laughs> they use the gold that they got from the Egyptians on the way out. And they make an image. Why? Because at some point or another, they'd rather see uh, humanity is geared so that the physical eyes that we have, we want to see something with that, something tangible, something that we can hold in our hands and touch with our hands and see with our eyes and hear. And God is a force in a spiritual way that, that sometimes we don't always see. The, the, even the poem Footprints in the Sand you know, though there's a time there's one set of footprints. Oh, our first reaction to that is God left. And then in the poem, it really says, no, that's when I carried you. That we can't always see. Our, and our feelings are tied up in that. So we feel that maybe God has abandoned us. We feel maybe left out. We feel maybe this way or that way. And, and the truth is, a lot of us feel more comfortable. We have something we can hold in our hands and touch. And so they, they, they were in this problem. And so he says at the very beginning, uh, no other gods don't make for yourself an image and that kind of thing. And then in verse five, he continues on because this is very important. Uh, you shall not bow down before them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He's saying, right, listen, I, if I'm God, I want to be God. If you could follow some other God, go do that. And then, But then he says, all right, there's, there's, there's a... Uh, uh, consequences for following the, the wrong God. He said, I'll visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So what he's saying is, listen, it's a generational thing. If you leave me behind, it's going to be even more difficult for your children to find me. It's going to be more difficult for your grandchildren to find me. So you stop coming to church. You think it matters to you. It matters to you, but you're raising your children not in church. Therefore, it matters to them. You're raising your grandchildren not in church. Therefore, it matters to them. And that can be a three or four generation thing. And so what do we see? Well, he says, don't, don't make a carved image for yourself. And I have a picture on screen of some carved images. And, and these are some, I guess, that were found by uh, archaeologists in the area during that time. Uh, some of them look rather unique. I, I would just ask you quickly, look around your house and how many of you have uh, a carved image uh, and you bow down every night to it and you worship it. And, and so most of us would say, no, we don't have that. So then does the first commandment matter? Obviously, though, I'm the Lord your God, no other gods before me. Obviously, that matters. But what about idols? What about idolatry? Do we not being ones who carve an image out of stone or out of rock. Do we still have idols? Well, let's look for a minute at the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel sees idolatry in a slightly different way. And so let's read a little bit, Ezekiel chapter 14, starting in verse one. It said, then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Therefore speak to them and say, thus says the Lord God. And here's what he, his reaction to these people who are elders of Israel, who, who Ezekiel is saying and God is saying, not that they have idols on their mantle at home, but that they have idols in their house. He says, any one of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart, sets the stumbling block of his iniquity. So, so the idol is a stumbling block. He said, you're putting that right in front of your face. And yet comes to the prophet, I'll, I'll, I'll answer him as he comes with the multitude of his idols. So he says, this if you bring your idols to me, I'll entertain that. And this is why, that I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are estranged from me through their idols. So he said, listen, here's what happens. You set up an idol. You have a carved image, okay? You begin to worship that. You begin to trust that. Tim Kennard, I believe, says, an idol is anything that we go to for something that we need God alone to give us. God alone gives us salvation. That's why we don't need to turn to other things for salvation because God is our Savior. Uh, God is God, so if we turn to something that's not God, okay, then that's idolatry. And so he's saying, listen, I, I want to get my people back because I lost their hearts to these idols. So what happens is we set up something physical that's in the way. And then that physical ekes its way into our hearts so that our hearts turn from God. You say, well, can I 
worship God with my heart on Sunday and then worship something else with my heart. No, that's not the way it works. He said, you can't have two masters. That's what Jesus says in the New Testament, you can't have two masters. So what does that look like? What does the idolatry of our hearts look like? And I will spend the next several weeks talking about that uh, because I think not only does idolatry still matters, our heart matters where our hearts are. Um, uh, where your treasure is there, will your heart be also. So we need to treasure the right things. We need to set the right priorities in our lives. But I think that there are different areas probably than, than the Old Testament where we have um, set up idols. So we're going to talk about that over the next several weeks. But but one more thing I want you to, to be thinking about as we go through this process. And i got a slide here up on screen. And the, the, the picture there is a Canaanite god. Because the Canaanites are the ones that Israel had a lot of problems with the Old Testament. Uh, L E L. And it's made of bronze with a gold leaf. It's an interesting thing. As I was studying this idea of um, uh, an idol, the idol basically the meaning is of idolatry is something which is seen. If God is spirit and God can't be seen, then the idol is some representation of God in some way. It's, it's an image, all right? It is um, an appearance of something. And so here's the idea, not being able to see God with our physical eyes. Instead of seeing God with our spiritual eyes, we create something that can be seen with our physical eyes. Does that help us to see? Isaiah says no. And here, here's an interesting passage of scripture, one that I haven't put together in a long time, but when you search Bible verses for idols, some really interesting verses come up. We, we look at those. Isaiah 44, 9 all who fashion idols are nothing, and the things that they delight in do not profit. And here's what he says. This is awesome. Their witnesses neither see or know. An idol is something meant to be seen. And Isaiah says, by putting that up there, you, you, you've actually blocked. You're blind to what you need to see. So we need to see God with our spiritual eyes. But we can't see them with our physical eyes, so we turn off the spiritual, turn on the physical, and we're over here focused so much on this idol. We've got it so much in our minds that that's what's blinding us to actually see God. When we talked about uh, integrity, integrity was, was all of us united as one, uh, kind of in this holistic sense. Worshiping idols is divisive. It divides us. It, it, it says we, we, you know, we have two masters, right? We can't have two masters. I love the African proverb shared it not long ago. He who walks two roads splits his pants. You can't have it both ways. And so God says, choose you this day who you'll serve. That's what he says to Joshua. And that's where Joshua responds as for me and my household, we'll serve the Lord. But we have all these other temptations. Okay, we have all these other options. What could we, what could we worship? What could we follow? What could we trust that are more tempting because they're visible? But the Bible says trying to worship what's visible with the physical eye is what will blind you with the spiritual eye and you'll never be able to see. So he says, uh, <laughs> the witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. And then he asks this great question. This question applies to us too. Uh, who fashions a God or cast an idol that is profitable for nothing? Why would you even do that? Why would you put something valuable into something nothing? Well, here's the idea. When you make something that can be seen to showcase that which is unseen, faith is the essence of unseen. Uh, and so, right, when you make something seen, you're, it's, it's useless and it blocks our vision, right? The other thing, there's a graven image, a graver or somebody who, who creates or sculpts or engraves something. If you made it, <laughs> it's not God. If the creation makes something, the creation can never make the creator. And so you're, you're, you're like um, a cat chasing its own tail, trying to find God. <laughs> nope, <laughs> it's your own invention. And you put to shame here. <laughs> I'm sorry, it, 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 the predicament we find ourselves in is humorous to me. All who fashion idols are nothing in the things they delight and do not profit. There's no greater description of that than a cat chasing its own tail and not profiting. I guess he has fun. And then it says, these witnesses neither see or know that they may be put to shame. Trying to find something and looking up and like God and ending up worshiping your own creation is the height of no profit. It's the height of being put to shame. And so idolatry essentially shows us to be people who don't know what's valuable. 
because we've replaced something that we created. We've replaced the creator of the universe with something we created. Uh, and so over the next several weeks, we wanna dive in, we're gonna look at different scriptures. We're gonna talk about things in our culture today, not necessarily all several thousand years ago, but things in our culture today that we're tempted to treat above God, uh, to worship, to serve above God. I hope that you'll join us for all the other installments. Hope you enjoyed this one. Hope I got your mind wandering a little bit about, huh, what, what might the idols be that I'm following today? Uh, probably not one of the characters that I showed a minute ago uh, on your mantle that you bow down to every night, but, but in our hearts. What do we put on the mantle of our hearts that we bow down to in our hearts? Uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, uh, God bless you and hope that you're doing well.